Jeffrey. Jeff, go ahead. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, thank you for organizing the conference, uh, Marcel. Uh, only, I only know two people uh, by name, Marcel and Kwame. Hello, Kwame. Uh, I joined the conference to see basically how Marxists, all the writings of Marx could be made relevant to contemporary imperialism and environment. And I should say that I do so from the position uh, having a long time uh, decided that the Marxist model of 19th century capitalism was not uh, currently relevant and that therefore I'm seeking always for Marxists to help me find as it might be. Of course, if you do that and you still cling to a caste analysis, let me warn you from my own experience, bourgeois scholarship will not tolerate a class analysis when it's not delivered by a Marxist. They're happy when it's delivered by a Marxist, but not otherwise. Now, what I just discovered is that uh, 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 Ulrich and Marcus I found uh, extremely interesting, and I look forward to reading their book. Uh, and it would seem to me that they are making an effort to put uh, their environmental and ecological concerns within the framework of capitalism. However, there are a large number of leakage points in it, uh, particularly, uh, for example, introducing the counter-hegemony uh, concept and also the idea, for example, that solidarity requires empathy. All of these, I think, are somewhat extraneous to uh, the core uh, relationship of um, uh, uh, found in Marx. Uh, Covey, uh, for me, uh, came uh, closer to uh, really uh, introducing absolutely essential uh, characteristics of the current situation, particularly referring to state, uh, indicating that there is more than just the relationship between uh, capital and labor. And he particularly uh, mentioned the idea that one of the ways forward will be look, look at to the uh, at a social formation, which is what I've used in my, my own work. Although it, it, that does sound a little bit like varieties of capitalism, it's more than that. If you really uh, look at a social formation as a configuration of different types of exploitation. Uh, the other reason that I joined was to see if there was any progress had been made on the, uh, on the issue of global solidarity. And I think there has not been much uh, movement since I last uh, looked at that particular situation. Now, I should tell you that uh, I worked for 17 years uh, for an international trade union, uh, which if you do that, then you, you do come away with an idea that there is no global solidarity. Uh, normally, um, the meetings of workers across the world collapse to what we call in the international trade union business as uh, the my country bit. So you start off with a great uh, abstract idea of getting solidarity on a particular issue, and then you get 25 people standing up and saying, in my country, this happens. Unfortunately, the academics do the same thing. I won't give you chapter and verse now. I've, I've written down the in my country bit from your, from your discussions and you will be surprised how basically ethnocentric both academics and workers are. The point is, as Kave sort of points out, there's 194 nation states in the world and the idea that you try to get solidarity between 194 working classes divided as they are by religion, nationality, race and culture, it's a pretty tall order. And it's a pretty tall order when there is no empirical evidence that they are likely to be united principally and only by the material condition and principally and only because their relation to capitalism. And I think that Therefore, I do see some indications of eclecticism. I do see some indications that 
uh, in, for example, in the case of the super exploitation, this is a, a, a lattice work of, of exploitation. It's not only, for example, I'll give you a good example. The American industry legacy payments for pensions is being supported by German workers. So it's a transfer from Jamaica, uh, uh, German Jamaica, uh, uh, auto workers to American workers. And that goes on all over the world in a massive tariff race of different exploitations, different trading uh, 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 terms of trade between different sectors. I do see some glimmers uh, for a more eclectic approach. And I am, of course, uh, as I always am when I interact with Marxists, uh, so, so happy to hear that the class relationships still remain predominant. And that is, of course, our, if I could say our, on the left, strength. It's a class analysis and a class analysis within gender relations and a class analysis within the working class is most important for the future. And I think because this last session is about where we go from here, that is where we should go, I think. And that's what I do in my writings here in The Hague and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, I think that certainly that some of the, your approach is in many respects compatible with what we are doing here. Uh, but I don't know if everybody here knows about Jeff's work. But, uh, we'll certainly learn more. Everybody will learn more about this in the near future. Uh, we have a second uh, speaker and I assume it's not sure. Andy Higginbottom. Or is he not? Andy, are you still there? Yeah, I didn't realize I was a, I was a second speaker, but I'm, I'll grab the mic that you offer me. Um, I, you might consider this an in-country approach, but um, I have to sort of like, kind of like pick a fight in a way, I guess, uh, in this democratic space with a slight degree of what I consider complacency and the idea of radical reformism. I mean, I think the, the time has run out for that project, to be frank. I mean, for reasons that John outlined. Um, you can't have your cake and eat it, I'm afraid. I mean, if you're a social democrat, come out and say so openly. I mean, that was actually Corbyn's problem. Um, Corbyn uh, program was to save British imperialism. I'm sorry to say this, right, because I've worked with him uh, as an ally of uh, anti-imperialist struggles, but you can't gloss this over, right? I mean, the, for example, on the question of the environment and climate change, they did absolutely nothing to uh, take on the real perpetrators in my country of the destruction of the planet, which is the big oil corporations and the big mining corporations. And it's a, a sort of, um, what's the word? It's a repetition of a sort of historic myth that British workers created the welfare state. I mean, the money for the welfare state in its mass majority came from Africa and Asia, uh, which is what John was pointing out. Well, this is not just a historical point. I mean, basically most of the income of British capitalism, it might well be different in Germany, not sure it's so different in France and the United States, right? Majority of the income of British capital comes from overseas. So when we talk about super exploitation, we are talking about a world which is structured by imperialist exploitation. that has different forms in Argentina, Chile, what have you, right? But to deny this sort of underlying uh, structural transfer of value uh, from subordinate countries of the world and the imperialist countries, I think is sort of like, also a deconstructing the whole point, right? You, you can't get over this, this division within world capitalism. And so we can find examples of super exploitation and oppression elsewhere, but they all are within this sort of context. And the social democratic solution is always one which is predicated on a continuation of that structural context. So uh, I think that we have, until now, we have six topics that uh, could use further reflection. I don't know if we will have the time to discuss all of them uh, in extenso. Uh, but the first thing is uh, the question that uh, Uri and uh, Markus posed already uh, early today uh, about what are the turning points in 
the historical development of the uh, imperial mode of uh, uh, living. Uh, for instance, they mentioned the 1970s. Would that be a turning point that is worth exploring to understand better what happened uh, in the development of the IMOL? Uh, we can maybe think of other options here. The second point is the point uh, is the issue raised by uh, KV, twice even raised by KV, uh, and which is important. And the question is to what extent is the struggle. Uh, against imperialism, uh, the only struggle, or have we uh, other items of, of uh, or, or, uh, gay, uh, aims in, in, in struggle? And uh, how can we avoid the uh, reasoning, which is not so unusual, unfortunately, on the left, that the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Uh, so how can we develop a, a better position uh, on this? And that would connect with the third question, uh, which was just raised again also by uh, uh, Jeff, the question of solidarity. Uh, how do we, what are, how can we analyze the possibilities, the prospects and, and, uh, and so of uh, solid, international solidarity? Um, a point which comes back all the time in the papers, but not so much in our discussions today, is the concept of super exploitation itself in its different uh, theoretical forms. Uh, there's a lot of this in the paper by John, of course, there's something, uh, quite a few things in, in Ben's paper. Uh, and uh, I think that this is a crucial notion for understanding uh, many of the aspects, all, also of the imperial mode of living, but also of uh, other aspects of uh, the relational inequality. And it could deserve more reflection. Uh, what do we think, for instance, of uh, the distinction that uh, John makes uh, following Walter Daum on absolute and relative uh, super exploitation? Is that a convincing uh, division and also, there are lots of questions that we could pose. And finally, uh, is of course the whole issue of a radical reformism, which Andy just uh, uh, raised again. Uh, is radical reformism just social democracy? Or uh, Joachim Hirsch would not agree, I think, but. Uh, 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 I'm not entirely sure about that. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a topic for discussion also. So we have lots of discussions possible. And then, of course, the final question is uh, also raised by, by Uli uh, earlier uh, about methodology, how to go on with the research, what would be the interesting ways to further explore the appeal mode of living or also uh, notions of super exploitation, uh, also to ground them empirically, to develop uh, theoretical insights uh, of a greater consistency and so on. So that, uh, uh, these are the questions that I think could be raised. And then Kwame has a seventh question. Yeah, quick question. I, I mean, I've had some speakers on the left and the critique on social democracy. The point is, should the left spend more time fighting social democracy than the right wing and the fascist, or what? Of course. Yeah. Our main enemy is on the left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the critique is more on social democracy, yeah. more on the critique and yeah. the social democracy. Yeah. That's a good talk. It's not a good talk. It's not a good talk. It's not a good talk. Yeah. yeah. So, so when we should I think the question here was, but but Kwame, I don't think uh, the question is here whether we uh, start a hate campaign against social democracy, but to what extent radical reformism is different from social democracy? That is the question. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so, no more than the are these the six topics that we can agree on that uh, would need. Or could you use more discussion? We can, yeah. Go. Just one point that is related to the question yeah. of exploitation raised by uh, John Smith. Um, I think it's quite uncontroversial that, yeah. that the exploitation. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So, uh, 
one point that is related to the question of super exploitation that was raised in, in John's uh, paper, I think it's quite uncontroversial that the rate of exploitation is not higher in the West. I think this is a, a point which has been made by Kalinikos and others, which I probably would think that it's not tenable. But the other question related to that is the question of value creation, whether value creation is actually um, it's, has a same degree of surplus value extraction, whether there is no difference between the degree of value extraction in the so-called global south and so-called global north. And I think there the question of the differences between absolute surplus value and relative surplus value is quite crucial and would, would help to kind of further the debate. The debate. Okay. Uh, and then we have Ben Selwyn, who also has something to contribute. Yeah, just... Um... I just wanted uh, maybe Marcel or any of you guys to say, I mean, you've got this list of things to discuss. Can we I see mean, your beautiful face, Ben? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you got this thing, you got this list of things you want to discuss, but I mean, what's your, I mean, you know, you say you want to push forward the IMOL research agenda, but I mean, how do you see that going forward? Um, is it is it going to be driven by you guys? Is it going to be workshops? Is it going to be, I mean, how do you see this? Uh, I mean, you know, yeah, that's an important preliminary question. That's, that's it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what we, we hear in this uh, SOC 21 Foundation, uh, we have uh, been thinking about possible future uh, workshops on the themes where we would also, I think, need more time to discuss than we have today. Uh, and we could do this in cooperation with other foundations. We have already been uh, exploring this possibility uh, a little bit with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in uh, Berlin. There may be other uh, alliances possible, uh, but that's the kind of thing uh, we have been thinking about until now. But of course, people may have other proposals which are much better than this. So. No, here in the room, there's nobody who has a better idea at the moment. Um, so and we have, I think for us as a research foundation, uh, still, the the two the two things that need most of our attention is first how to do further research, which also would include, I think, questions like turning points and history and uh, uh, dyna uh, the dy dynamics in the coming years, uh, and uh, super exploitation as a critical concept, uh, which is used here. Uh, and that could be connected with uh, anti-imperialism would be, I think, a logical uh, combination. Uh, and the strategy would be the third thing. So how would, uh, about the possibilities for international solidarity, uh, global solidarity, how about ideas like radical reformism uh, or other strategies, uh, what to expect from trade unions, Jeff, uh, with a uh, long experience in the unions, is quite skeptic about this, uh, and uh, well, I, I think he's correct in being a bit skeptical. And yeah, um, I see now um, Jeffrey uh, with raised hands. Yeah. But does that mean that it's an old hand, or is of course it's an old hand? But... <laughs> Uh, is it uh, is this hand for a new contribution to to the discussion or not? I can uh, unmute you if I do it right. I raised my hand because we couldn't. I don't know if other people had the problem, but I couldn't hear what Kwame was saying. Ah, yeah. yes, because yeah. Kwame Kwame was not. He was muted. Yeah. So he was starting to speak. No, I put my, I raised my hand to try to correct that. It's too late. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll come back again. Don't worry. But, but yeah. can I say? Uh, can I talk to uh, Jeff? Just one, one, one sentence. Okay. One se Hey, Jeff. Hi. Good afternoon. Good to hear from you again. That's the sentence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he was saying that uh, uh, we should not make uh, social democracy to our main enemy, uh, but the radical right. Yeah, Jeff? Jeff, do you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry. No, no, I, uh, I had no, I just couldn't hear him. It was just a technical. Yes, so now you know roughly what he what? said. 
Okay, all right, yes, okay. Well, Good. I have no comment on that. So <laughs> then maybe we just continue then with the discussion. Then we will just mute Jeff again, yes. Yeah. Okay, now. Uh, Markus has something to say. Yeah, um, just one of the points um, Marcel raised, so the question of how going on with further research. I think it's quite an interesting and consolation we have here because we are historians and political scientists, political economists, and I think we could indeed take advantage of this and consolation by doing a kind of historically comparative research. You mentioned the turning points. Yeah? The historical turning points, Willie mentioned this in the morning in his contribution, they are important because we can study in these turning points how certain patterns of production and consumption emerged, how they were able to marginalize alternatives, and what can we learn from this for the situation today. I think we are also in a turning point today. So what can we learn about this turning point today by comparing it with historical turning points? I think the turning point today is characterized by, uh, by some developments that were mentioned in contributions here. So I will pick out two. One was strengthened by Ben in his contribution. That is that the northern working class is increasingly, uh, they, or that, that, let's say that the social contradictions in the global north are increasing. So this is also an assumption that we have when we work on the imperial mode of living. We would say yes, and this is a qualitative new situation because um, the um, integration, the inclusion of the northern working class into the imperial mode of living is increasingly questioned here. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean for an understanding of the situation we are living in now? And what does it mean for a role of the working class in overcoming the imperial mode of living? This would be one point. Another point would be indeed this question, are we um, in a transformation towards a green capitalism? This would be a, let's say, regulation theoretical question. Yeah. We see a lot of science for this. We supposed that this transition would take place 10 or 12 years ago in the financial, in the financial crisis. Yeah. There were a lot of discussions about the green economy. There was a summit by the United Nations, but this discussion became, sad, became silent again because um, the growth um, was reinstalled again and was not a green growth. But now in the crisis situation today, we experience a complete different situation. We experience that relevant capital factions are going for a green capitalism. We experience that the European Union is in favor of a European Green Deal. Yeah? What does that mean? Was that, what does that mean for analytical purposes? And what does it mean for emancipatory struggles? I think these are questions that can be discussed and that can be discussed in a historically comparative perspective, making or taking advantage of this interdisciplinary co constellation we are in here. That's a very clear uh, proposal. Uh, any objections? Uli, you are against this. Of course, I'm always against what Marcus says. <laughs> um, just to, if we want to pursue this, it depends on us, on our um, uh, um, collective uh, will. Michael Brie, who worked at the Rosa Lux Foundation, he looks currently into the 30s from a social ecological perspective. And he asks, going through literature, where, what were the turning points there? which then came out as a New Deal or as others or Fordism or whatever. And this would be, he's not here, but probably he would join also this, sure. this group um, to, um, to, to bring in this knowledge. And maybe some of you work in, on other, on other um, historical phases or whatever. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, then we have John. That's a very different thing to say, I assume. <coughs> Just there's so many points in this very rich discussion. We're going to be uh, needing many months and years to really work through them. Um, and I hope this conversation. I'm sure this conversation will continue. I think this conversation, in some ways, uh, feeds into a bigger conversation, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, conversation that's already taking place in many other parts of the world about the nature of contemporary capitalism and imperialism. I just wanted to respond to one or two points. I think that uh, um, in Ben Selwyn's paper, 
where he looks at the emergence of super exploitation and uh, extreme forms of class stratification within the imperialist countries is clearly important. The issues which Ulrich and Marcus have raised about the uh, uh, role of unpaid, and also Ben also talks about this as well, unpaid domestic labour and other and other forms of exploitation um, that raise whole questions about how patriarchy and oppression of women relates to the. Um, cap capital labour relationship. All of these questions are uh, extremely important um, and absolutely extremely important. I think there is a slight danger that by trying to emphasise these in a particular way, we can lose sight of the centrality of the imperialist division itself. Yes, there is a growing, if you like, third world or uh, apartheid, even hierarchy of uh, the organisation of the working class within imperialist countries. But that is still a reflection of and a function of the global division between imperialist and, uh, and so-called emerging countries. It is amazing when you look at the, the statistics, the actual size of the gap between the handful of imperialist countries and the rest of the world. We have to constantly remember and remind ourselves of how big this is because as soon as we start looking at, at class differentiation within imperialist countries or look at the role of the national bourgeoisie we're looking at fundamental questions but they're still secondary they're still secondary to the primary division and the facts speak for themselves if you actually look at the proportion of the world population that live in countries where the per capita GDP is less than $10,000 per year at purchasing power parity. Uh, it, it measured with PPP dollars. That's less than $10,000 a year. And you look at, then that is something like 80% of the world's population. And then you look at the number of people who live in countries where the per capita GDP is more than $35,000 a year. In other words, three and a half times the $10,000 that 80% of the population live in countries where that's the average per capita income. If you look at countries where it's over $35,000, we've got about 15% of the world's population, which is the imperialist countries, the global north, including Australia. Yeah, okay, well, that's part of the north for these purposes. It's a simplification, okay? The actual number of people who live in countries where the per capita GDP is between 10,000 and 35,000 is about 5 or 6% of the world's population. Korea, one or two other countries. We have the continuation of a gigantic chasm between imperialist and oppressed nations, which is what Lenny talked about, continues unabated. There's all kinds of nuances, all kinds of complications, but we cannot lose sight of that central fact. And that's why I think there's a slight danger of when we start focusing or looking at the uh, uh, secondary divisions, um, look at the uh, reproduction of imperialism within the imperialist countries. And it all comes down to another thing that as well, and that is before we can develop a theory of super exploitation, we need to have a theory of exploitation. And we all think, oh, we've already got that. Marx's theory of exploitation, it's all summed up in an incredibly simple formula, S divided by V, S over V, the rate of exploitation. And it's deceptively simple because the S can be described as surplus labor and the V can be described as necessary labor. In other words, if you have to work four hours to replace the value of your labor power, and you work for eight hours, then the, you're spending four hours producing S, surplus value for the capitalist, and the other four hours replacing your V, the value of your labor power. And a simple, simple arithmetical uh, procedure, dividing the one number into the other, gives you the rate of exploitation. What a that is the deceptively simple formula for the rate of exploitation. It's deceptively simple because Marx in Capital made a whole series of simplifications, assuming that labor and capital were perfectly mobile, assuming that every commodity, including labor power, had one single price. 
these were massive simplifications, and he did so in order to exclude any form of monopoly, any form of violation of the equality between buyer and seller from his quest for a general theory of capital. Massive simplifications which were arguably necessary and justified for his purpose. But as soon as we, and on the basis of those simplifications, the S over V, the rate of exploitation, becomes incredibly simple. Now, in, in the appendix to my paper, which I'm looking forward to doing a new version of that's more readable and improved in many ways, including with your comments, so please send them in, your criticisms. In that paper, I just there's something that I uh, do, which I thought, think is a very interesting thought exercise for a start off and that is if you look more closely at the different factors that determine the size of s and that determine the size of v in other words if you look at the denominator and the numerator of the simple formula s over v if you look at the denominator and the numerator separately and consider what different factors affect each one of them taken separately, suddenly a simple formula becomes incredibly complicated. Not only that, but you find, without going into the details of it, you find that the different factors that affect the size of V have almost nothing to do with the different factors that affect the size of S. That S and V differ not just quantitatively, but qualitatively. The amount of value that workers generate in a given period of labor, expenditure of labor, has, is entirely different from the value of that labor power. The value of the labor power and the value generated by it are fundamentally qualitatively different. One of them is the denominator, V, and the other is the numerator, S. So two completely distinct cat categories can be combined into a deceptively simple arithmetical formula. And it seems to me, because we've refused or failed for various reasons which are comprehensible and incomprehensible to me, for 150 years, we have failed to relax the simplifications that Marx made in capital and that he warned about repeatedly, saying that in reality these are really important. Because of those simplifications, we still have this incredibly simplistic notion of what exploitation is. And if we start just at first glance looking at the factors S over V separately, we suddenly d discover there's a tremendous amount of research there to be done. But I just think there we will find that one of the factors that affects the value of labor power is the amount, the strength of patriarchy, is the role of unpaid domestic labor, the whole gender question becomes central. That, uh, as uh, um, my friend Andy pointed out in a discussion recently, the, uh, in capitalism, labour power could only be created on the basis of the inequality between ma male and female, the inequality in the bourgeois family. Uh, and in the working class community, which creates the conditions for uh, labour power to be provided as a commodity on the market, is actually predicated on the inequality that uh, discriminates against women. So, in other words, when you start to look at that, is clearly one of the ma a major factor. That and the strength of the so-called informal economy, which is especially important in uh, in low-wage nations, then we start to see that we can uh, develop a theory of exploitation, which includes all forms of inequality and violation of equality yeah. in capitalism, including gender. We create a unified theory of exploitation, which over comes the problems of uh, the, the, the feminists and Marxist feminists have pointed out about the seeming incompatibility between Marx's law of value. Those are the, the things, and I'll just finish on, just on this point. I'll just finish on this point, and that is that since Lenin, the whole theory of imperialism has been misunderstood by the left to be a theory of monopoly capitalism. Really, imperialism has two fundamental principles at its centre monopoly and also super exploitation. There are reasons why super exploitation does not appear to be at the center of Lenin's theory of imperialism, although I'd argue if you look for it, you will find it there. It's just that when Lenin was writing, the relationship between capitalists and oppressed between imperialists and oppressed nations 
was not a relationship between different capitalist economies, but a relationship between capitalism and pre-capitalism and the sort of uh, imperialist exploitation that took place at the time Lenin was writing was in the form of plunder. Um, I mean, the exploitation of wage labor was certainly a component of it, but that has become the general feature, the generalized feature, only in uh, the period of globalization of production. Okay, uh, oh. you, John. Yeah. Or did you have something very important to add yet? But, uh... So it's just that we need to have a theory of imperialism which unifies monopoly and super exploitation. Yeah. And in fact, I would argue that super exploitation is most important because that talks about the actual production, the labor process, the production of value. Whereas monopoly is all about how the uh, proceeds of exploitation are shared unequally between different capitalists. Yeah. Thank you. I think that especially Joost will like the idea of having a unified theory uh, because as a physicist, he's also always looking for a unified theory, isn't it? Uh, yes. <laughs> you don't have to say anything if you don't want. But, uh, no. but, uh, we'll keep him muted. Okay, yeah, we keep him muted. Uh, our next speaker is Uli, doesn't have to. Okay, and Markus? Are you okay? Good. Um, maybe I should add something here to what uh, John said. Two, two things. One is, of course, uh, that it is not only now that we are seeing that uh, Marx's assumptions about uh, uh, simplifying assumptions about one market and uh, one uh, value for labor and so uh, labor power is is uh, is being rethought. It has been done before, but the interesting thing is that these. Uh, initiatives have not uh, uh, gained the recognition that they deserved it. Of course, starting with Rosa Luxemburg's accumulation of capital and then Sternberg's uh, the imperialismus and so on. There's a whole range of uh, authors who have uh, devoted attention to this, but this never really been picked up by uh, uh, left theorists. Um, the other thing is, that we should maybe also take into account that uh, in, there is a, uh, you know, Isvan Messaros, uh, the, the former Hungarian British uh, philosopher, he wrote this enormous book, uh, Beyond Capital, in which he says that there is an equalization of the rate of exploitation historically, uh, which makes sense in itself, uh, although there are all kinds of counter tendencies. Uh, and uh, I think that at this moment, we I think that the period that we have noticed uh, has seen between, let's say, the 1920s and the 1980s was a remarkable period because it was, uh, in, uh, let's say, for 20% of the world population in the richest countries, it was creating a special situation with uh, standard employment, all kinds of social security, and so on. And already in the 1960s, my old teacher, Ernest Mandel, said this cannot last forever because... Uh, First of all, it cannot be generalized uh, worldwide. And secondly, uh, the finances of the system are very fragile. And uh, this is a temporary phenomenon, the welfare state. And I think he has proven more and more right that we are returning to a situation before uh, the 1920s. In fact, there's even now a, a much uh, uh, regarded book in Germany uh, by a literary historian who so shows that the period of the, 19, the 1830s and 40s, the formats, is now coming back in the sense of class, uh, uh, con diffuse class relations and uh, uh, all kinds of other things. So um, it is important, I think, to see also that uh, we have uh, lived, been going through an exceptional period, we as people from advanced capitalist countries, and that uh, now we see a return of older forms. For instance, just one example, Gallup, the Institute of kind of the Advisory Consultancy Agency, they do, uh, since 19, 2014, they do uh, polls, to, uh, worldwide polls, to discover how many people are unemployed or underemployed. And in one of the recent publications, they uh, criticized the ILO, the International Labour Organization, because that uh, the ILO for years now already says that global unemployment is about 5 to 6%. But uh, according to Gallup, it's 33%. 33%, they, say, they define as a decent job people who have 
uh, 30 hours a week a job with one employer. This is a minimal uh, definition, of course. But even according to this definition, many, many people in the world would like to have that kind of job and don't have it. So they're fully un unemployed or they are working fewer hours and would like to uh, work more hours. So that's why they say that worldwide unemployment and underemployment are 33%, which is historically unique. I mean, in the, in the whole 19th century, that was not, never anywhere the case. So uh, this kind of development shows that there is a, sort of, a certain tendency, not the absolute tendency, but there's a tendency towards a certain immiseration going on on a, on a world scale, which we should perhaps also take into account. Mm -hmm. uh, but so the idea here is that we could study super exploitation, but for that, as John has so eloquently just uh, explained and also done in appendix number two, that for that we also would need a theory of exploitation, which then uh, John will uh, present to us in fully mature form uh, very soon. Uh, and then we can work on that and uh, develop a theory of super exploitation and from there also going on, on issues of uh, anti-imperialism. Now, the third topic is maybe the most important and the most difficult, and that is question of solidarity and about reform uh, revolution or radical reformism. Uh, I do not yet see clearly how we could organize a workshop or a conference on that, but maybe somebody has an idea. Kwame has an idea. Uh, am I yes. Yeah, yeah. O on the question of uh, solidarity, if I, I pose that question also in my response, I mean, the question is whether solidarity is a kind of a one-way traffic, yeah, in which we say the global north has to be in solidarity uh, with the rest of the world. That's where uh, I, I pose the question here, where uh, do, do, do we need a kind of uh, more missionaries and charities or more development aids or more band aids? You know, because if you talk in terms of uh, solidarity, we should also uh, consider the basis of our knowledge production. Yeah, because basically, our well, knowledge production is a, a foundation threefold, which is problematic. That is, it is Eurocentric, it is nationalistic, and it is also compartmentalized in the sense that the, uh, the sciences, the social science, the disciplines which we use is so compartmentalized that when one historian is talking about something is totally different that the economics will be talking about something is different. And also when I say Eurocentric, I don't mean uh, Europe, in, I mean institutional sense, that the way our universities are organized, it doesn't matter whether you are in, here in Netherlands or in Dhaka or you are in Shanghai, the curriculum, the knowledge base is all Eurocentric in the sense that we start from uh, the same positions of 19th century social science development and all those things. And also nationalistic, which Jeffrey uh, and others have been touching on where we start from our national positions. But if you look at it reasonably in terms of solidarity at the level of knowledge production, then what we see is that social nature relations a lot of things that are going on, maybe we look for technical answers to these problems like electric cars or whatever the case is, but maybe the answer does not lie in this going deeper into technical uh, technologies within Mercedes-Benz or within auto industries. Yeah, if you take the case of uh, wildfire in the California now, yeah, where a, a young, a child of nine years died because he was trying to drive a car and the uh, and the the tar the road was so heated that it caught fire the tires uh, caught fire and the, the child died uh, al along the way i mean 
they don't want to build railways, for example. They don't want to build uh, trains because of the interests of the auto uh, factories. Now, automobile industry. But if we talk in terms of knowledge production, when I was in Ghana, Africa, I said, but the people are talking about solar energy, but it is the countries that have no sun that want solar energy. And the, 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 the countries in Africa that have the sun, they don't have solar energy. Yeah, they talk about uh, uh, the, the climate change. Reforestation is not a uh, technical issue. Planting enough trees can create so many jobs for uh, people in Africa. So if you're talking about New Deal or what is Green Deal, new uh, green uh, uh, policy in the European Union, you're talking about whereas maybe the answer lies outside Europe, which can also help uh, Europe, but still we're looking for all the answers from Europe and for the Europeans to help other people. But maybe we don't need money for everything. We need different frame of reasoning if we talk about global level. But if we don't start from the whole and we use the parts, yeah, then we get the problem which we have been discussing because you start with super exploitation and then people will come and add, what about this? What about that? What about that? And that is also the issue which uh, uh, Andy uh, 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 rose, because the point is that he added people like, uh, like uh, Claudia Jones, Ro Walter Rodney, uh, Angela Davis, and all those into the uh, debate. Of course, they have made the points, but the point is if you start from the parts, you end up discussing this way that you should also add these people. But if you start from the whole, then in theorizing, which one says general theory or um, a, a, a grand theory, then you can include all these things. Otherwise, what we have is like a cruise ship and a kind of a lifeboat that we discuss the cruise ship and leave the lifeboats and we go to the lifeboats only when the ship is sinking. Yeah, but the point is we have to include all these in, in the discussions and therefore taking the whole, if we say global north and south, then we also have to question the issue of reorientation of the world economy to the Orient now. Is it worth talking about global north and south, whereas the economy is shifting now in favor of Asia? Yeah, so, so the question, if you divide the world into capitalist, non-capitalist, then you may think that, oh, Japan is different from China. But if you think in regional terms and you put Japan, China, and South Korea together in the Asian country, then you see that the economy is even larger than the European Union economy. Yeah, so you come up with different orientation about the way to look at the world and uh, also how you relate in the relation to solidarity. So if we talk about solidarity, I don't think that we have to talk about it in paternalistic terms, in terms of what we can do for the glo global South who are suffering more than us. Because maybe there are people we think are suffering, but who do not think of themselves as suffering. Because if somebody is walking without a shirt at a beach here, you don't say the person is po poor, because I see there's a kind of voluntarism that the person does not wear shirt in the sun. But if an African is not wearing shirt, you think that the person is, does not have a shirt on because he is poor. Yeah. So, 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 so we have to reorient our uh, uh, theoretical frameworks and also question the foundations of our knowledge production, but not to think in terms of a paternalistic way of solidarity whether we can help or whether the working class here can help uh, the South more. For me, the left will do better by exposing the hypocrisy and the thievery of the system here by exposing the fact that they have stolen uh, people's money and then keeping them in the banks here and uh, hardly is anybody talking about it. They are talking about sanctions against Iran, sanctions against Iraq, sanctions against uh, Libya, and all those things. Uh, and then while they are keeping their monies here, and uh, people do not talk about it. When refugees are coming here, the refugees fall under international law. 
but people don't, do not make reference to international law and they allow the right-wing fascists to carry the debate. Yeah? So these are some of the issues which we, we have to discuss if we talk about solidarity. We, it's it's a, a question of knowledge and also a question of exposing the right wing rather than we fighting among ourselves on the left. Okay, yeah. thank okay. you, uh, uh, Kwame. Uh, Lucas? Yeah, uh, coming to the, the topic of uh, potential ways to work further. Uh, I, I think indeed one big uh, topic that occupied us today, maybe almost all of the time, is somehow the political economy of imperialism, if you, if you want to use that word, or uh, which I would do, or uh, relational inequality. So how does it work uh, in more theoretical as if, if you get to a unified theory, or not, etc. That's one line uh, of further work, and I see it more clear. I, I, not, not that I have the solution at all, but I see that's one line of work. Then maybe, and coming to the point that you raised on this uh, topic, maybe um, on the topic of solidarity, and, and, and there maybe it's also the, the, the further line of research is more historical and more political, or maybe a history of political uh, political history, let's say, because apart from the fact of, on how this political economy works, uh, you can also look at real experiences, historical experiences of solidarity or not solidarity. And Marcel, Marcel, of course, knows a lot about this. He's been doing this for many years. But a further way to go is to discuss or to see further which were the cases in which this internationalism or this transnational solidarity actually worked so how what happened what was it and of course we have the idea of, of course the, the first international the second international but this the third international the fourth international but there's of course more than that much more than that and and and, and there's also less than that because not all these internationals were so internationalist in, in real in 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 real life so that's one way to go at, i think to discuss uh, experiences of real historical uh, solidarity or not, and uh, and this not only necessarily means, in my understanding, uh, international um, organizations. It's not that I say let's start an international organization because I agree with Kwame that you can show your inter your internationalism working in your own in the country where you live, not your own country working, doing things in the country where you are. You don't have to be only uh, doing, uh, going to an embassy to protest about something that happens elsewhere and be, and be, uh, and be quiet about what actually happens uh, in, in, in the country or in the region or wherever you are. So also that means that you can, we can also study uh, this kind of uh, um, activi activities, and especially those, of, those activities that bring yourself in trouble, because going on a Sunday to an embassy to protest against unequal conditions is, is good to do. I mean, I, I, I prefer people who do that than people who don't do it. But uh, it's more interesting when it really, okay, it really brings you in trouble. Trouble with your material interests or trouble with the police or trouble with the government. Those are the real experiences in which historically you're showing uh, some courage. And okay, this is getting more serious. And this can be doing something against uh, the, the treatment uh, that uh, Europe gives to migrants, which is criminal, completely criminal. And life goes by, life goes by, except when, when then the, 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 in Lesbos it got into fire. And then for a week we will be talking about that. And then we'll forget about that. And, and life will go by again. So also those are, I think, topics to, to, to explore. And, and of course, I'm, I don't mean uh, to solve this politically. Uh, when I say further ways to go, maybe to, 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 to do research about it. Not that we will solve because it's not up to us uh, to solve anything like that. We, I mean, not as a collective here, we might find ways uh, to, to do what we feel. But uh, I think also that's a topic, at least that I'm interested in. Exper mm -hmm. uh, and of course, this is related to the political economy. Sure. But, but not, uh, not automatically. And, and one last thing that I think is really, sorry, for also this includes an actor that is important, that is nationalist movements. Uh, it's an actor that is critical in the in this. Sorry, because we live in an imperialist world, for 
more than a century already, and in most of the third world or the global south, anti-imperialism is real, but it's also very much attached to nationalist, bourgeois nationalist movement. That's a fact. We might like it or not, but that's a fact. Uh, that's a fact we have to deal with. And also it's part of a discussion of international activities. Because if you have international, when, when Chavez and, 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 uh, and, and Lula and, and Evo Morales in the heyday of uh, the 2000s, let's say, gathered uh, against Bush, George Bush in, in Mar del Plata in Argentina, uh, that was an internationalist movement, yes, but also not necessarily working class based, you know what I mean? But that's also a topic that needs to be assessed and, and brought into the picture. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is a very constructive idea, uh, Lucas. Um, and if we, for instance, take these instances of, let's say, uh, real internationalism uh, and study them historically, then we could connect that, of course, with the whole idea of the, uh, the turning points in the growth or degrowth of uh, the imperial mode of uh, living. So that would, that would be a, a backward slope in a way then. So, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's uh, is something that is feasible, I think. I hear another voice in my web sleep. Can I speak just here? No. No. <laughs> Come here. Yeah, you can take this. Uh, we want to record you. You cannot start your video. I think we also have to take into account the uh, what we can call the objective uh, political situation in, in which all this uh, uh, plays out. And I think that it is important uh, to see the decline of, of US imperialism and the rise of China and also the weakening of the European Union as something positive. Huh? because it creates a multipolar world in which uh, anti-imperialist uh, forces have a bigger chance to have an, an impact. So I, I, I think this is, a, this is something which we have into, uh, uh, take into account also. And I think that um, uh, this process uh, of changing the imperial mode of living will not be a smooth uh, process. It will be a very uh, dramatic uh, uh, process. And I think that uh, um, we should not be uh, afraid of the crisis. We should not try to avoid the political and economic crisis of, of uh, imperialism because we cannot uh, avoid it we we have to uh, to um you have we have to use this uh, crisis to uh, change the uh, imperial uh, mode of uh, of uh, living right now the majority of the left is is trying to save capitalism uh, they are they are, are trying to uh, to uh, innovate it and try to change it and hold their hands under the system because they are so afraid of the crisis. But crisis is necessary for change. Change doesn't Jim, come. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then I think yeah, Uli and you want to say something? Somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uli. Yeah, I would like to add, uh, thank you for this thought. Um, it's conflictive, yeah, because we shouldn't cheer crisis because usually our crises are um, fought out at the back of the weaker, the weaker. And, but it's a more a systemic perspective, but um, um, we argue in our book that um, a the installation or the push for a solidary 
mode of living will be highly conflictive yeah, because you have to devaluate capital, for example, fossil capital and others. Two thoughts. One is I would like to underline what Kwame said on the, on the global knowledge order. There is an interesting concept in Latin America from Edgardo Lander from Venezuela, who used the famous concept um, from Anibal Quijano from Peru, the coloniality of power. And Lander says it's the colonial, coloniality of knowledge, the colonialidad de saberes. And uh, this linked to Boaventura Sosa de Santos' argument of the epistemologists of the South. And I think that to bring this always in yeah, here and what is, what is the kind of the undervaluated um, knowledge. But I would like to talk briefly about solidarity, repeating a bit what I said in the morning. And I was, I was active in the Zapatista solidarity movement in the 90s. And I remember well, probably as others of you um, too, that um, Subcomandante Marcos, gave um, the honorarium of an interview for, um, for a television um, uh, um, uh, um, station, $500, to the striking Italian fiat workers. And he said, this is solidarity because I support your struggle in Italy to improve your living conditions, but also to go beyond um, um, exploitative international relations, because this was also part of the solidarity declared by the fiat workers. And um, I found this quite interesting. And our argument is, and hopefully we can, in, in another occasion, we can um, um, work it out more concretely, um, as, as, as Lucas also said, to change here the mode of production and living in an internationalist perspective, because our point is we are writing also our stuff against a very attractive dynamics of capitalism, which is ecological modernization, which is solving capitalism, if you like, but also um, dealing with the ecological crisis at the cost of so much other in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Austria, in Western Europe, if you like, yeah, with electrification, e-cars, and so on. And what does it mean then in the struggles to understand the struggles and to look, I wanted to ask this, John, but maybe it was, um, it was too late of the day. What does it mean to say there is a centrality of imperialism of the North-South relations when we want to convince the progressive parts of the trade unions here, they are part, of course, of imperialism, of um, the, the parties, the left parties, the, 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 the leftist parts of the Greens. What does it mean to say the main contradiction or the main split is North-South when they are integratively, yeah, they are not just bored, they are not just talking, they want to change something, but within their societies and to, to acknowledge these deep contradictions and then to look, we call it in our projects, entry points, to look for the entry points, the tiny, the weak, uh, um, difficult entry points for a change here, but acknowledging that this needs an internationalist potential, anti-imperialist, whatever we want to call it. This is a bit our work. And in this sense, I, I find John's intervention important to say it's North-South. But it, it's not useful, I would say, for the concrete strategizing here, because it, it, it's not your point, of course, but it's the danger of others to, to have this perspective, to denounce these weak flowers, these weak attempts to, to change something here. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Rodrigo? Oops. Sorry. It's... I cannot start my video. I don't know if that is. Ah, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry I, I, I could not follow you this uh, morning. I had some other things to attend. Um, but I, want, I wanted to react very briefly to the question of how to proceed uh, in terms of uh, a research agenda. Uh, I think uh, pursuing a, a theoretical framework it's always interesting, but uh, perhaps more important and more pressing is uh, are the empirics. Um, and I think that uh, what is difficult of the, of the current moment we're living in, especially the last year, the, 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 the particular types of interventions by central banks, uh, what has been happening in the, in the, uh, in the, by monetary authorities, uh, it is quite a, an innovation. Uh, and uh, I think historically unprecedented, if you look at the, 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 the size of the balance sheet of central banks, uh, they are only comparable to the darkest days in the, se in the Second World War, uh, and we are not at a war at the moment, and there's no end in sight. Uh, and there's many reasons, I think, to, 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 to think that uh, we need better ways to understand 
the world we're living in now. And especially, I think, if we want to compare it to developments in the 1920s and 30s, uh, in these days, also new theoretical uh, concepts were developed. Uh, uh, monopoly capitalism, uh, financialization, um, and, and I think that uh, a, a comparison would be very useful uh, to understand our current time, but that this, then we are really in need of to have better empirics. And I think that that would be the, an interesting part or task of, of, the, of a research agenda. Thank you. Uh, then we have Amanda Latimer. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. That's great. Thank you. Um, thanks for the mic. Um, I just want to go back to the solidarity um, issue and the point uh, that a few people have raised. I don't think Andy was, of course, he could clarify for himself, but I don't think he was thinking about symbolic forms of solidarity, but rather something structural and something that um, a Swedish trade unionist, and to be honest, I, I'm sorry to say, I can't remember his name, uh, but a few years ago, uh, we were at a meeting and he was talking about talking to workers about enlightened self-interest. So the issue, I think, particularly with, with Marcel's work and that uh, um, over the, the past few decades is to expose the contradictions between sections of the working class that have facilitated a race to the bottom globally. And I think that is the work that uh, left uh, parties, social democratic parties. And to be honest, trade unions um, and movements have been failing at. We've been losing strategically over uh, the last 30, 40 years. And I think uh, this type of a space, we need to analyze why. So the Social Democrat Party, you know, for example, the Labour Party here in Britain, the Pink Tide, their approach was to try and strike a new yeah. deal with national capitalism. You know, there's also an issue of, of how much the working class is actually represented by trade unions, which, you know, the conservatism of trade unions, uh, their shrinking membership. And I do think there's an argument to be made that the failure of social democracy actually led to the rise of, of fascism. So we, we need to have some type of analysis that illustrates to workers preferably led by workers, not academics, that there's no exit for the planet, but there's also no exit for working class people in the global north included within capitalism, and that this isn't actually a slogan. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, but you can't see me probably. Uh, okay, um, we have uh, two messages from uh, Teresa El Amin, uh, and uh, she asks where whether there were any women speakers available. I heard the mention of Angela Davis, or was she invited to speak? I can say something about this because we have been struggling with this topic uh, also. Uh, and uh, we had one woman speaker, Rosanna Baragan, but she fell ill, and so that's why uh, Lucas uh, Poi stepped in for her, but one out of six is still certainly not enough, but uh, it was very difficult to find speakers because, for instance, somebody like Angela Davis, we could not invite, we could, we could not pay her, cover her uh, 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 trip from California to here. We have only invited speakers from nearby, from Germany and uh, the UK. Uh, and then Teresa says in the second uh, message, we must recognize and challenge all systems of oppression, capitalism, imperialism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. Excluding women is an error we should have overcome at this level of discourse. Talking about super exploitation and leave out women who are still fighting to pay equity is troubling. I can understand the, uh, this very well that, uh, that Teresa is saying this, but uh, of course, we have uh, lots of women in the in the audience amongst the attendees, and uh, we were thinking also of inviting uh, Maria Mies, uh, who is a great scholar and has done a lot of work in this field, but she is also not well and in her 80s. So uh, yeah, it's it's very difficult, but uh, the problem is there. Yes, sure. Um, considering time, it's five to five. I think that we should gradually come to a conclusion. I think that uh, we have three clear 
topics for further activities. And it is now up to uh, the board of the uh, foundation and its advisory board, because I'm only in, a, in the advisory board, uh, to, uh, to think more about this and to make concrete plans for uh, the near uh, future. And uh, this concludes my contribution to the workshop. And now I give the floor to Joost. Yeah, OK, thanks. Well, everybody, um, it was a long day. And uh, I'm, well, very pleased that it, it worked out. I will start some making some comments with uh, a dangerous joke my good friend and comrade Marcel made asking for a unified theory. Uh, this is fundamentally ahistorical. Theories are human-made, including metaphysics IDs like unified theories. Unified human solidarity is another different kettle of fish. And that is what we are discussing. Uh, and anyway, the board and our advisors, including Marcel, will discuss the possibility to continue this workshop, maybe more targeted, uh, together with you and see how we can do it. This is our first uh, workshop. We only, we don't even exist for a year, but it is a proof of concept that it can be done. We will try to follow up and rely on your suggestions, comments, and collaborative endeavors. I mean, uh, in an anti-authoritarian environment, don't think the teacher or the board of the foundation will do it. No, we do it together. I mean, that is the first rule uh, for socialists, I think. Um, this conference is, as, as I said, a proof of concept, and we will do all what we can to bring more people together and have more international conferences as well and even other research projects. Uh, some uh, concrete proposals are made. We are collaborating. We do all our own research projects. And on the website, you see a few initiatives we have there. And we invite you all to join us and suggest projects, preferably with more people. So no suggestion, why don't you do that? No. Let us do that together and let's look into that things and we do the best to, to try and find some in infrastructure. So I would like to thank all participants, uh, panelists and also our donors. We don't have sponsors because you don't see any flashy banners. We have donors. We invite other people to become donors to enable this kind of things. And um, please stay in touch with us and, and send us suggestions and ID to together foster our common goal. And I wish you a very nice evening. If you are in Amsterdam, well, the weather is beautiful. If you are somewhere else, I hope the weather is also nice. Uh, this was it for, for today. And uh, hope to see you soon. And uh, let's go on with the struggle together. Okay. Thanks.